like to say good evening to everyone and thank you for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Shara Wanko and I'm a professor of English at Westchester University and I'll be moderating this evening. Um, so first a few words and then a short review of how this session will unfold. Um, just to put it on the table at the beginning, right? We all know that many chemicals make our lives better, right? I don't think anyone is gonna argue with that. However, indiscriminate and widespread use of toxins in our environment, as well as in our food, personal products, clean airing products, et cetera, um, requires much more attention. Um, toxins individually and in combination that have either not been adequately uh, tested or have been proven deadly to humans and other members of our ecosystems result in harm that needs to be addressed by residents, companies, and our public leaders. We can't afford to use the earth and our bodies as petri dishes. So tonight, our panelists are going to be telling us about one category of these toxins, pesticides, uh, and I'm hoping that they will help us understand some of our options for action. So we have with us Emma Horst-Martz of Penperg, Cara Rubio of Women for a Healthy Environment, and Drew Tower of Beyond Pesticides. And I just wanted to thank you, want to thank you for attending and for taking time out of your busy schedules um, to speak with us. And thank you to the Westchester Green Team and to Westchester University's Office of Sustainability for making this event possible. So um, here's how the event will unfold tonight. Um, first, we're going to have a couple of words of welcome from Dr. Bradley Flam, who is our Director of Sustainability at Westchester University. Uh, then I'm going to ask the participants, the panelists, to uh, introduce themselves and their organizations quickly. Then we have a set of, um, you know, set questions that I've asked the panelists to think through. So we'll get through some of those. And then towards the end, we'll open it up for um, questions from, from the audience. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat, okay? Um, I think I am going to, um, I can mute everyone at this point, um, just to avoid that background noise. And then when it's your turn to speak, if you would please unmute, that'd be great. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see, a couple more announcements. I'm expecting that uh, we'll wrap up at about eight or 8.15. Uh, and this uh, presentation is going to be recorded. So if you'd like to um, you know, turn your video off uh, to avoid being uh, recorded, um, this is just to let you know um, that that's what's gonna be happening here tonight, okay? All right, so with that overview, um, Brad, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Thank you, Cheryl. And I, I will make it a few words. I just want to um, say thank you um, to you, Cheryl, for uh, moderating this panel discussion this evening and to our three speakers for agreeing to offer their expertise uh, for uh, this evening's uh, discussion. Um, depending upon how we calculate it, we are either finishing up four years of collaboration between the Office of Sustainability at Westchester University and the um, Westchester Green Team and the organizations that um, uh, are part of the Green Team, or we're starting our fifth year already. Either way that you calculate it, um, we are uh, grateful for this partnership with our um, neighbors in the borough and in the county. And uh, we are looking forward to this evening's conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Um, so we're going to turn first uh, to Emma Horst-Martz of Penberg and have her introduce herself briefly. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to see everyone on the call tonight. I'm excited to get into it, but first to introduce myself. Um, again, my name is Emma horst Martz, and I'm an advocate with PenPerg and the PenPerg Education Fund. Um, it's the Pennsylvania Public Interest Research Group. We are a statewide grassroots organization working to protect the public from powerful special interests when they may threaten our health, safety, and well-being. 
We work on a number of different issue areas, including public health, um, access to public transportation and improving multimodal transportation, consumer protections, um, a whole host of issues. Um, and in terms of our actual work, we do research, you know, produce reports to educate the public, work with great coalitions of partners like Karen Drew, um, and then build or gather support from the public and deliver that directly to elected officials to pass policy either on the state or local level. Um, and just a little bit of background on our work in um, pesticides, which I can get more into later. We've been working on the general issue area of toxics and pesticides for decades since our inception in the 70s and 80s. Um, so this is really a legacy issue for us. And I think it covers so many different areas, but I think it's really important to have folks who are interested in making change in their communities, because that's really where it all starts and oftentimes a place where people are being the most impacted. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and I'm excited to talk more with the other panelists. Thank you so much, Emma. And now we'll go over to Cara, Cara Rubio, Women for a Healthy Environment. Thank you. I just wanted to extend my gratitude for holding space for this conversation. And thanks to the Westchester community for uh, coming out to learn more about these topics and get your questions answered. I am the Healthy Schools Pennsylvania Program Manager with a Pittsburgh-based environmental public health nonprofit called Women for a Healthy Environment. Our practice is really public health and the environment and the built environment. And we're, we think about all the ways that um, our environments by design affect our relationship with health. And we have a healthy homes program, which is primarily concentrated in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. We have a healthy early learning center program and a healthy schools program. Uh, and healthy schools is uh, my baby and I have a special love for the K-12 and university space because those are the folks I get to work with day in and day out. Um, and when we're thinking about public health, environmental public health and health in the built environment, um, you know, we're really focusing on technical assistance. So how do we, what are the technical solutions to issues of pests in the building, mold, indoor air quality? Um, we do a lot of work on education and capacity building. So we empower folks, school to stakeholders to be able to make those decisions and have the knowledge needed to uh, create positive public health impacts in their communities. And we also have a health policy program um, that's pretty new to our organization, but that is really focused on systems change. And all of those components are really important when we're talking about pesticides and other chemical exposures. And so um, I hope to bring a public health perspective to this conversation and talk about uh, population health effects and how we can think through what the community impacts are um, and not just actions on an individual scale, but uh, how do we really move and shift power into systems change? Thanks a lot, Kara. Okay, and now we're gonna to move to Drew Tower. Great, yes. Hi all, thank you very much for having me. I am Drew Tower, the Community Resource and Policy Director at Beyond Pesticides. We are a national nonprofit dedicated to educating the public about the hazards of pesticides and encouraging and promoting alternatives to their use. A bit about me, um, I have a master's degree in environmental science and policy from George Mason University. Uh, before my time at Beyond Pesticides, I worked at an organic heirloom tomato farm uh, and a mid-Atlantic region farm club where we work to connect local farmers with customers. Um, at Beyond Pesticides, where I've been for the last 10 years, uh, we take calls directly from the public uh, and we work with advocates, scientists, policymakers, and communities across the country to eliminate the use of toxic pesticides in favor of natural practices and least toxic products. Uh, over my time at Beyond Pesticides, we've worked with dozens of communities to pass local laws prohibiting toxic pesticide use. Much of this is focused on lawn and landscapes, but we also work on mosquito management, school pesticide use, invasive species, farm worker protection, organic integrity, pollinator protection, a whole range of other issues relating to pesticides. Um, and in general, you know, awareness of pesticide hazards is increasing. Uh, much of this is in part due to these high profile lawsuits around the carcinogenic herbicide glyphosate. Uh, and there are growing concerns over the decline of pollinators uh, and other insects due to systemic pesticide use. Uh, many academics are calling this an insect apocalypse. 
Uh, pesticide use is also an, is an issue of environmental justice. Uh, reports show that parks and playing fields uh, in black and brown communities are more likely to be sprayed with toxic pesticides and landscape staff and farm workers are more likely to be from BIPOC communities. We were very pleased uh, that the city of Philadelphia recently tackled and addressed this issue of toxic pesticide use in public spaces uh, by passing a strong, a strong ban on certain lawn care pesticides. And I'm really just excited for a robust discussion tonight. And hopefully that'll encourage some of you folks in the audience uh, to work towards a similar policy in your community. And just really quickly, I'd just like to lay a quick foundation here because we often get comments or questions about this. What is a pesticide? Well, a pesticide is an umbrella term that includes herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides, all the biocides intended to mitigate, re repel, or kill a pest or weed. So if you hear folks using pesticide and herbicide interchangeably, it's usually okay. Every herbicide is also a pesticide, but not every pesticide is an herbicide. Hope that clears some things up, makes sense. Excited for the discussion. All right, great. Thank you for laying that groundwork. And it sounds like folks are coming from really interesting directions um, that will complement each other well over the course of this conversation. All right, so let's start out uh, with some basic questions. Um, and what, at this point, do you see as uh, the most dangerous pesticides now in use and, and why? So let's lay some more groundwork. Um, Emma, could you start us off with that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And I don't come at this as a scientific expert. You know, I'm a political advocate. So I can say, you know, at PERG, both Penn PERG in Pennsylvania and across the country with our national partner, US PERG, for many years now, we have chosen to focus our advocacy efforts in banning the use of glyphosate that Drew just mentioned, which is the main ingredient in Roundup, um, the very popular weed killer made by Monsanto. Um, and this is in part because there is just a very clear and ever-growing body of evidence that glyphosate is harmful to human health, um, and to the environment. And there are serious consequences to using it so widely across you know, our lawn care, our agricultural systems. Um, it's one of the most heavily used chemicals in our country. Um, and it's having deleterious effects on our health and the environment. Um, it's also something that I think, as Drew mentioned, people are just more and more aware of as these lawsuits sort of pile up and they've become pretty high profile, um, given all of the people who have unfortunately gotten sick with cancer over the years from being exposed to it. So I think it, there is good reason to focus on glyphosate in particular, um, but my fellow panelists can probably talk about some of the other chemicals that they've identified. Do you want to take this too? Sure. I, um, you know, I'll, I'll agree with Emma that there is like a specific, uh, there is a specific focus on glyphosate because it's widespread. We know it's in our water systems. We know that it's uptaken in produce that's planted and in farms that use it to control pests. Um, and we know that it's stored in our bodies as well uh, from biomarker testing. Um, I think, you know, whenever we're thinking about pesticides as, as a group of, of chemicals that we can be exposed to, uh, you know, Drew really set the stage well by, uh, by saying that there are any product that's designed to kill something, right? So all the hand sanitizer we were using, all the disinfectants to clean, those are technically all pesticides. And so they are regulated, um, whether it's an herbicide, something meant to kill a bug, something meant to kill rats, they're regulated uh, through the same process in the EPA. Um, it, you know, we can really get into the weeds talking about specific main chemicals, but these, a lot of these uh, pesticides are often mixtures, right? So they have an active ingredient and they have inert ingredients. Um, and, and when we consider mixtures all together, um, I, I like to think when we do our pesticide presentations to schools uh, is to think about classes of chemicals. And so glyphosate and corpyrifos, 
please correct me if I say that wrong. It's, you know, in the Zoom world, you're just like used to typing stuff and not saying it out loud anymore. So <laughs> uh, sometimes some words, I'm like, what, how, do, how did I used to say this word? <laughs> I, you know, those are two uh, pesticide active chemicals that come to mind and they're in the class called organophosphates. And in that class of chemicals, we have a, a bunch of stuff that's contained in there. Uh, flame retardants are part of that as well. So it really gets you thinking like when we're thinking through these chemicals, these specific chemicals um, for diverse uses, uh, they kind of have a, a really interesting like chemical makeup that makes them similar to each other. Um, and, and I would say that this class is really uh, interesting because of how neurotoxic it is. So pesticides, um, you know, they affect a lot of systems in the body. Um, and uh, because of that, <laughs> it's a little bit hard to, to study uh, what the long term effects are. And I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit. Um, but I, I would say, uh, from our organizational standpoint, uh, we're really concerned about that class of chemicals and any pesticides that fall within their glyphosate and chlorpyrifos. I think that's how you say it. You know, those are the two that are really jumping out to me that I wanted to mention by name here. Thank you. Yeah, and already I'm seeing, you know, there's possibilities for following up on all of these things like indoor versus outdoor pesticides, right? So, um, and recent studies of uh, Roundup that have even shown that the other stuff in it besides the glyphosate uh, has, has harmed bees when it's sprayed directly on it. True. Yeah. So uh, thank you, panelists, uh, for, you know, talking about glyphosate uh, and the organ organophosphates. I think those really are kind of, you know, I, I I'd say they're the most uh, obvious response, you know, chemicals like chlorpyrifos, uh, chlorpyrifos. I don't think it, it matters all that much. Um, <laughs> uh, malathion, NALID. Uh, most of those organophosphates have been curtailed for use by homeowners, but they still remain on the market for agriculture. Uh, but I'm going to focus on for this question, I think the emergent science is showing that chemicals with endocrine disrupting properties may be the most dangerous for public health. And uh, it's not just pesticides that we're talking about that are endocrine disruptors, a range of personal care products um, also are endocrine disruptors. These are chemicals that can mimic hormones in one's body. They bind to the body's hormone receptors and they can cause a cascade of ill effects and chronic diseases. Uh, everything from cancer to developmental and reproductive problems. Um, and it's important to note that endocrine disruptors harm the body at very low doses. Um, they actually exhibit a more toxic effect at a lower dose. And this, I'm gonna throw out a very complex term. It's called non-monotonic dose response curve. Uh, if you wanna completely you know, impress or confuse your friends with that one. Uh, essentially, it throws that whole concept in classical to toxicology that the dose makes the poison and more of a dose is going to be more poisonous for you completely on its head because we're talking about very small amounts that are actually more toxic than larger amounts. And this concept can, it can seem a little bit esoteric, right? So I like to remind folks, you know, these tiny hormones are so important to your body. They're the switch that controls so many facets of one bo one's body and appearance, you know, think back to puberty. Um, all those changes in your body were a result of these slight changes in your hormones. Um, and when this process gets disrupted, we can see really far reaching effects in human beings. Uh, now in terms of regulation, uh, EPA was tasked with regulating endocrine disrupting pe uh, pesticides in the 1990s through a bill called the Food Quality Protection Act. Uh, the European Union started uh, its program around the same time. But while the European Union has begun to regulate these chemicals, EPA has not even established, finished establishing its screening program to determine what chemicals are endocrine disruptors and eligible for regulation. And so with that lack of oversight here in the US, uh, with these endocrine disrupting chemicals, that would lead me to say at, at this point, they are the, the most dangerous in terms of you know, potential long-term effects on public health. Would you like to Hi. respond? Hi. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Um, I think that the other piece that's probably helpful to clarify is that while we have a lot of evidence, as Drew is describing, um, and as Kara mentioned as well, of the effects of these different types of chemicals in combination alone, different systems in the body, um, I think it's important to remember that a lot of us, and I, I think 
you know, my fellow panelists, we all follow this as well. Um, we often, or we try to follow the precautionary principle, which is the idea that you shouldn't use a substance, in this case, pesticides or a chemical in a personal care product or whatever, shouldn't use that unless it's actually proven to not harm people. You, it needs to be proven safe. And that's really not how chemical usage is monitored or regulated in the United States. We sort of go from the opposite approach that you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that something is harming people or the environment and come up with all of this evidence, which of course the science behind it is really important, but we shouldn't be exposing people to things that are making them sick in these ways that Drew's describing unless, you know, I mean, there really is no reason to use those sorts of substances. So that's sort of how we approach it and shows like the opposite of how oftentimes our lawmakers and federal agencies are approaching the, the whole problem. Yeah, I'm, can you say, since we're kind of heading in that direction of bioaccumulation and body burdens, um, could you maybe talk a little bit about that? I know it wasn't on my list, um, but uh, it seems to be that's where we're heading. Um, so any does anyone want to say something about that? Kara, go ahead. Yeah, um, that's a great like concept, right? When we're thinking about chemicals, because it's one thing if our body uptakes them or we, we are exposed to them in another way, but it's, it's a totally different uh, ball field when we're thinking about how the body stores those over time. Uh, and what's really interesting is uh, there, there's this huge national study where we collect a lot of biomarkers, basically like urine, hair, blood samples, saliva samples from a bunch of folks, a really representative sample of those who live in our country called the NHANES study. Um, and pretty consistently what we find in every cohort are that the folks in our population who carry the most pesticides, uh, the highest pesticide load are children aged six to 11. Uh, and that is a really fascinating insight uh, for one reason, those are school-age kids, right? Those are not the typical under six that we think about when we're thinking of other legacy exposures like lead poisoning, um, which is another issue in our state, um, or when we're thinking about uh, these other early environmental concerns. Um, and, and so there is a biological mechanism for the way that these pesticides are stored in the body. Um, and I think it's really important when we think about exposure, uh, not just uh, how it enters the body. So for pesticides, we're thinking a lot of ingestion, uh, eating through produce, but also dermal absorption. And some pesticides can pass through the skin bar barrier and go straight into the blood. Um, we're also thinking about the time of the time in your life when you're exposed, right? So if you think about what's happening in the bodies of children ages six to 11, that's like pre-puberty stage, right? But there's there's a lot of growth happening. And this is where the, the concepts that Drew was introducing about endocrine disrupting chemicals are really important. If a chemical looks like something that's naturally produced in your body, um, that is the biological mechanism for which, that can be one of the ways, right? For which the body stores it over time. Um, and, and this would explain why we are seeing, seeing multi-system effects in children in particular, and some of the, uh, health outcomes that we're seeing that are linked to a uh, high pesticide exposure are um, really concerningly a lot of developmental disorders, right? So we're seeing changes, not just in how brains are growing and bodies are growing, but in how children are behaving, um, the way they socialize with other people. So it's, it's really specific parts of the brains that are being turned on and off or that are not being allowed to develop in a healthy, natural way because these chemicals are being stored and, and blocking that natural process. Um, and, and when we think about how exposure is carried in a population, right? So pesticides are a widespread exposure as a, as a huge class, right? All of us probably have a little bit of pesticides in our blood um, or somewhere in our body. However, who's getting really sick because of that exposure, right? So that gets to the question of disparities and disparities are when we see a difference in health outcomes and downstream causes. And when we're looking at who's getting really sick who's going undiagnosed, whose kids are not getting early intervention services uh, when they're showing up with these developmental delays. Uh, you know, they tend to be the same populations. Uh, in, in our state, we know that, uh, you know, when we're, even we're just looking at asthma or 
other uh, childhood health outcomes like that on the little data that we collect, we know that the burden is not carried equally, even though the exposure might be um, widespread, the who's actually getting sick are children of color, uh, low, lower income families, families in rural areas close to agricultural places. And uh, so while we're working on these issues, we need to think about what does intervention and, and what does policy intervention look like to protect those most vulnerable. Um, and that happens in, in the upstream form of things. Sure. Yeah, I would, I would just, um, you know, to add to that, all, all excellent points, you know, uh, our regulatory process at EPA does not adequately account for disproportionate risk, disproportionate risk to minority communities, disproportionate risk to children's uh, sensitive populations, those that are immunocompromised, uh, they, they simply don't account for them. EPA's pesticide registration process, um, the kind of analog that they look at for a human being is a 25 year old healthy adult male. Um, they are not focused on sensitive populations. So that's something that we've been really trying to interject uh, into reform measures is, uh, you know, to really start, start looking at that, um, those disproportionate risks. And I'll also kind of uh, uh, piggyback on uh, that whole concept of, um, you know, early life exposures. It's incredibly um, important uh, to avoid these early life exposures. And uh, scientists call these critical windows of exposure, and they happen during during pregnancy, during a child's first year of life, uh, during puberty, and it's you know it's really a time at which um, you know, the the genetics are are going to turn on and off, right? And it, you know there's a, a an emerging uh, amount of science looking at uh, metagenetics and looking at the switches that turn on and off genes, and and environmental exposure during that critical window uh, can actually cause you know turn on or off a, a specific gene and result in you know, problems 10, 20, 30 years down the road, um, chronic health effects. And I'll, the last thing I'll say is that there have been studies that have found in terms of body burden, you know, switching from a conventional uh, or uh, we don't, we tried to get away from that word conventional because we think organic farming is conventional. Um, chemical, uh, you know, agriculture, if uh, switching from that to an organic diet actually reduces uh, the levels of uh, pesticide that are found in one's urine. So you can actually reduce your pesticide exposure by switching to organic foods. Okay, that gives me a good segue because I'd like to move us outside. Um, I, a lot of folks in our community are concerned with spraying um, both by the state and by you know companies that are hired by residents and homeowners associations, et cetera. So um, could you perhaps talk about, I don't know, what what they spray uh, and their effect, the effects on um, ecosystems, pets. We've already talked a little bit about children, about uh, human bodies, but if we could, we could make a, maybe broaden that a little bit. And if I could start with you, Drew, at this point. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, most lawn care companies are going to use synthetic pesticides that are registered by the US Environmental Protection Agency. Um, apart from the fact that these chemicals are not necessary um, to maintain healthy lawns and landscapes, there are significant problems. You know, what we like to talk about are the deficiencies with the EPA registration process. You know, I could focus in on a, a specific chemical uh, for you, but I think it's more important to understand, um, you know, what's wrong with the process that allows these chemicals to come onto market. Uh, I think there, you know, Kara alluded to earlier, um, you know, you look at a pesticide label, uh, you notice that it lists the active and inert ingredients in a pesticide product. Well, the active ingredient is considered toxicologically active against the target pest. This is the chemical that EPA performs its toxicity tests on. But if you look at that label, uh, an inert ingredient also can, comprises a significant portion of that pesticide formulation, and it can be as high as 99%. But that inert ingredient is not required to be disclosed. It doesn't undergo the same toxicity tests, and moreover, it's not tested in combination with the active ingredient. And what we've seen from independent studies is that these other inert ingredients can make a pesticide product more or less toxic. And then in addition to mixtures and synergy, there are other complexities uh, that are not addressed by the pesticide regulation process. Uh, we already talked about endocrine disruption. Um, another aspect is that pesticides are often registered conditionally. Um, and this means that EPA will allow a pesticide to market uh, without required studies on certain health endpoints because the agency assumes that the chemical will not cause, and this is what EPA regulates to, 
unacceptable adverse impacts on the environment while it waits for that data. But there have been many instances over the years where the data was, that EPA was waiting on ends up causing a serious environmental problem. Uh, the agency also assumes that there will be 100% label compliance uh, with a pesticide, despite evidence that many homeowners do not read the label before, before applying a toxic pesticide. Uh, we, we talked about children and uh, the elderly, other sensitive populations not being provided additional, additional protections. And the agency also discounts restrictions that have been enacted in other countries. Uh, they discount the viability of alternatives uh, that are on the market that could replace the toxic chemical in question. And lastly, all of the data uh, that, that, that the agency reviews, that EPA reviews, is produced and conducted by the manufacturer themselves. And this is the basis, unfortunately, for pesticide registrations that are then approved by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Um, beyond pesticides, uh, when we you know, uh, work in communities, our model policy prohibits the use of all of these products. Uh, instead, our, criteria, our criteria allows for only products that are certified organic uh, or considered minimum risk by EPA. And these are, the minimum risk products are exempt from the EPA registration process because they are of such a low toxicity. They're not required to go through that. And we find these to be the least toxic yet still effective products on the market. But even these, we want to encourage folks to use as a last resort. So it's, I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, and I'd love to pick up from where Drew left off, because I think that's a really helpful starting place, sort of lay the groundwork for what the pesticide landscape or system sort of looks like in Pennsylvania. Um, so if you think about the sort of levels or the the areas where these chemicals can be used. Of course, we have agricultural use on farms. Um, the state can use it um, along highways, sort of at the state regulatory level, um, in local parks and public land, which is sort of regulated or legislated by local municipalities. Um, private property and homes, of course, people spraying stuff on their own lawns or you know, a property owner. Um, and then schools is sort of another category. And I'll leave that to Kara because that's her area of expertise. Um, but there's sort of all these different layers and there are oftentimes different rules about what can be used in these different places. And in Pennsylvania, we have preemption laws, which really function as they create limitations on what advocates like me and you know, Drew and Kara can do to change the rules around how these substances are used and where they're used and how they impact people. So here in Pennsylvania, um, we have preemption laws that prevent us legislating, like banning the use of toxic pesticides or chemicals on private property. So that means you know, we're not actually allowed to pass laws that will impact like what people are spraying in their own backyards, which is where we know a lot of people are being exposed to these chemicals. Um, we are able to pass laws on the local municipal level regarding what's used by the city or by city contractors on public land. So that's like a public park um, or along the side of the road or certain sidewalks that aren't owned by private property owners, sort of depends on the area. Um, but that's really the venue that we at Penperg and a lot of advocates across the state have been focusing on to change the laws around what can be used um, in these different areas because there's really the most opportunity to make change at that municipal level. Um, and then again, schools is often a totally separate category um, that needs to be dealt with, you know, in different ways in different places. Kara, would you like to talk about schools? <laughs> sure, I can. I just want to say quickly, like, lawn care, HOA, tree care companies that homeowners are inviting to spray and or might be spraying as part of your HOA, um, as part of the HOA agreement is, uh, if there's putting any chemicals, they legally in Pennsylvania have to have a pesticide applicator license. Uh, that means they get some training on how to use chemicals and how to store them properly. You know, what this means 
environmentally, it, there's a lot of greenwashing in those companies too, right? So be careful because uh, I, I can think of at least two that have green in their name that are very popular in Pennsylvania, not just in schools, but in, in the uh, private property markets as well. Um, and, you know, I think like, what are the ecosystem effects of this? Well, we don't have a lot of water surveillance in PA, so we don't know how much pesticide is leaking into our groundwater or into our watersheds that provide our drinking water. Uh, and, and that that kind of sucks because <laughs> we, we don't know what we don't know um, about how pesticides are moving through our waterways. Uh, they can also, you know, the way that they're applied can really affect our native populations. And so I know there's a lot of focus on pollinator populations, but I think like, you know, in the traditional IPM space, which is the integrated pest management space um, that a lot of schools I work with occupy, uh, we have a real uh, focus on native plants, right? So we love the honeybees. I love the honeybees. I'm sure you guys love the honeybees too, but honeybees are actually not native to Pennsylvania. Uh, and we have a bunch of other native pollinator species that uh, become non-target species when we spray, right? So when we spray insecticides, it's affecting, um, these non-targets as well, right? So that's a, a way we can think about ecosystems being affected by what we spray. Now, those going back to those uh, companies that are, are uh, you know, paid to spray in these spaces, um, if they have a license, they also have access to some of these chemicals that you can't buy at Home Depot, right? Like some of the stuff that they're not allowed to put on the shelf uh, in our, in our um, home improvement stores. Uh, as long as it has a registration on the EPA, whether it's conditional or not, it's free game for them to use. If someone is spraying on or applying pesticides on your lawn, they usually, they're required to leave a service ticket with you that has at least the name of what was sprayed. Um, you, what you can do is you can ask for something called the material safety data sheet to read more about the chemical. This uh, is kind of a doozy to read. I, I can put in the chat the, a few sections that specifically talk about health and ecosystem effects. Um, it's one of those things where the more you read them, the more comfortable you get with the language. Um, and you know what, what will they be using? They'll be using mostly organophosphates. We know that that's what's purchased and being used on school grounds, at least in, in our space. That's what we know contracted companies are using you know, they're getting rid, they're trying to get rid of weeds. Um, glyphosate is common to get rid of poison ivy, uh, which is a real concern in schools when you have little ones running around and playing. Uh, but, but that's usually, it's gonna be that class of pesticides that they're purchasing and applying to yards um, most of the time. Schools in Pennsylvania, <laughs> it's kind of a, a success, but not really story. Uh, Pennsylvania was one of the very first states in the nation to require all schools to use this program called integrated pest management. And it has a nice little pyramid of um, tools in your toolbox. Chemical pesticides are one of them, but there's other things like prevention, mechanical control. So, uh, you know, baits that, that clap on the tail of <laughs> other pests uh, that move through school buildings. Um, and, and while schools are required to have this policy, we know it's not enforced. When we did a statewide survey of public school districts in the state, 90% um, of them had an IPM policy that was passed by their school board. That's phenomenal. 70% uh, of those with the policy contracted with a pesticide company in the past year. So even as students were not in the building, these pesticides companies were coming to spray. That's not IPM. So there's a problem with enforcement, right? So. Um, that, and that's for a space that's regulated. That's for a space that where IPM is required. I know um, going pesticide free can be uh, difficult in some of these commercial spaces um, and in schools. So IPM is a great step to move from um, to move from like using chemical pesticides to finding other ways that work for you in terms of your resource time and cost that you have. Right. So if you are a homeowner, um, IPM could be a good step for you to think about um, where can I cut back the use of chemicals and what are some of the other mechanical preventive strategies I could try um, or design strategies I can try in its place and just kind of try it uh, and see what works. Um, so I'm happy to put some information about that in the chat as well. Can I, can I add something here just because yeah, yeah, uh, those of you who are aware of the mosquito management program in Westchester should realize that the basic approach has been integrative. The, the borough wanted to spray aerial fogging and the, the do not spray me group went about 
taking two different approaches. One was trying to limit larval habitats, so mechanical removal of standing water, and then used a very specific natural insecticide, BTI, in the storm sewers to try to control successful larval uh, uh, growth in the storm sewers, which you can't get to uh, and are, are quite common in terms of holding standing water. Um, but BTI, unlike your standard orthophosphate, is very specific. It really uh, hits black flies and mosquitoes, very few other non-targets, and very, very limited non-target impact. Um, another thing I just want to throw in because EPA and DEP are getting thrown under the bus a bit here. And what I would encourage you all to do is recognize that they do what they have money for and what they're allowed to do. As an agency, they are at the mercy of the politicians. And if you want more action from DEP or more action from EPA, have your politicians give them more money. They are constantly underfunded. And um, as an example to the idea of testing all of the, the, the products that end up in water themselves, they don't have a budget anywhere near that. So they work at it indirectly, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't fact check, shouldn't you know, have the resources, but they are constantly underfunded. Um, and, and trust me, if you talk to them, they know where their weaknesses are. They know, and they do the pushback as best they can. In, in fact, some of these examples that, you, that were brought up about the limits to what can be locally addressed versus has to be set statewide. You've heard that same discussion with fracking. In other words, the local communities were restricted in what they could or couldn't say yes or no to because there's a state law that says that's set in Harrisburg and not set locally. Those things, DP can't change that. That's out of their hands. So you need to talk to your representatives about pathways to empower some of the actions and, and, and activities that would help you see some of the, 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 the outcomes you're interested in and some of that's going to require money. And one of the easiest ways, hey, John. Um, one of the easiest ways. I, I think John should introduce John, himself. Yes, I, and I, <laughs> oh, yeah, and I, I'd I like to get us back to our, our, our panelists. John Jackson is our uh, local expert from the Stroud Water Research uh, Center. Yeah, yeah. And so he's been very active in these issues uh, locally. And I think he's leading us then into um, are a, a section where we talk about, right, how do we take action? I mean, John, you're saying, you know, put the pressure on, uh, on our elected representatives and they're requiring a lot of pressure on a lot of issues uh, recently. So um, maybe, yeah, maybe our panelists could talk about our success stories or how else we could uh, get involved as communities, as active communities in order to, uh, in order to control some of this. Yeah, well, first, thank you, John, for providing some of that perspective. And um, as an advocate in the state, both on the state and the local level, I totally agree with you that many of our agencies and departments across the state, you know, both at that state and local level, really need more resources to be able to do this work um, and are chronically underfunded. So totally agree there. I think the place I would start with this, um, and we can get more into tactics and ways of sort of banding together with your community um, to make change at whatever level. But I think a good place to start is just the example that Drew mentioned you know, in his introduction, um, where a coalition of groups here in Philadelphia, um, Penn Park was one of them, work to organize, kind of gather the support we already knew was here in the city to ban the use of toxic pesticides um, on public land. And I would say we're successful in you know, passing legislation to address that issue. Um, Councilwoman Cindy Bass introduced a bill that specifically banned the use 
most herbicides, so those chemicals that kill um, plants and weeds on public land. And it also created reporting requirements for all other pesticides that are used on city grounds in Philadelphia. And part of the reason why it wasn't an outright ban on all pesticides is because it just wasn't politically feasible. While there are many communities across the country that have either you know, fully transitioned to organic land management or they're using this model that Kara and Drew mentioned, integrated pest management, um, which ideally is only using pesticides as a last resort and in really limited and like the safest application of it. Um, there are a lot of communities that have started to do this work, but it's still not the you know, go-to way of thinking. And most you know, local agencies are really seeing this as too expensive to handle. So we started with the ban on herbicides and reporting requirements for other pesticides, um, which can help us do some of that advocacy work down the road to expand that law to ban you know, other classes within the pesticide category. Um, so that passed unanimously through city council. And then it sort of sat around over the holidays this winter. And Mayor Kenny signed or you know, vetoed all of the bills on his desk except this one. So it just sort of sat there. And then it hit this deadline in January where he hadn't touched it yet. So it was supposed to automatically go into law because he hadn't dealt with it. So that happened. And then Mayor Kenny got his legal team in the mayor's office to argue that the law violates statewide preemption. So city council can't actually legislate what the parks and rec department of the city can do and can apply on city grounds um, because of this statewide law, which is blatantly untrue. And what we think happened is, you know, the Parks and Rec Department was scared of having to implement this because they, you know, aren't really given the resources to do it, um, which of course we advocated in part of the budget process to increase their budget to be able to do integrated pest management or organic management. Um, so that's sort of the status right now. And of course, we're running a campaign to you know, gather that public support again, deliver it to the mayor, deliver it to the city council people who originally voted for the law to you know, really pressure them. At this point, it's a pressure campaign to actually stick to their word and implement it. Um, and there have been a lot of great groups and other cities that have offered to help do free education and work with our parks and rec department in Philadelphia to learn how to implement this on the budget that they have, um, but it's still gonna take some more work to, to actually get it implemented. So that's just one example of some of the dynamics that can play out here. Great, yeah, yeah, a lot we can learn from, from that example. I do wanna bring this part of the program to close in a few minutes, but I also want to make sure that Drew and Kara give us their um, advice for how to push back on some of this, especially for, for residents who are, you know, who are dealing with, with spraying. Yeah, I can, I can, uh, I can go and I can give a, a success story. Um, but first I'll say, you know, yes, the, the issue with Philly is, is, is very tough um, right now. And, you know, we have offered, um, we work, uh, one of our board members um, is a nationally renowned uh, organic land, uh, organic land care expert. We have offered to uh, work with the Philly Parks and Rec Department to help train them on organic practices. Um, and also just briefly to respond to um, what John mentioned, yeah, EPA is absolutely chronically underfunded. Uh, and the rank and file do care about this work. Um, we, we know that. Uh, and often, you know, a lot of the problems that comes out of the Office of Pesticide Programs at EPA is from the political appointees. Um, you know, there is bureaucratic inertia uh, in some way, uh, but yeah, a lot of the problem is, is certainly from uh, the political appointees and, and that gets back to uh, pressuring the politicians, uh, absolutely. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about um, New York City. Uh, so I think we're really making amazing progress in the pesticide reform movement. Um, and New York City uh, uh, sticks out to me 
uh, because it, it just followed after Philadelphia. It just happened. Um, and they recently passed a policy prohibiting pesticide use on all parks and playgrounds in the city. Uh, we started this uh, working on that issue in 2015, where we were connected with uh, Paula Rogovin. Uh, she's a kindergarten at a New York uh, City public school. And her focus was on getting kids engaged in making change early. Um, so after teaching her students uh, kind of about the dangers of pesticides, uh, they, they wanted to do something. And they eventually, they, all of this was their decision, uh, essentially. They decided uh, they wanted to, to take on pesticide use. And so they actually wrote a play uh, and they performed it for a local city council member uh, that, that came in to, to say hello to the class. And after he, uh, watching the play, they invited the kids to city hall. And so Ms. Rogovin brought the kids down to city hall and they sang uh, part of their play to lawmakers. And that made the local news. Of course, it was super cute. Um, I'm sure you can find the video online, uh, but nothing happened that year or the next uh, or the next. Uh, and despite constant pushing uh, from behind the scenes, uh, but in comes another group uh, based in New York City, uh, the Black Institute. Um, that group, I, I alluded to their report earlier, uh, they published a report and this was specifically focused on New York City based on public records request, uh, looking at uh, all the areas where toxic pesticides were sprayed in the city. And of course they found uh, black and brown communities are where most glyphosate use is, is occurring and toxic pesticide use is occurring. Uh, and you know, it's worth mentioning, you know, public parks are often the only place where um, in a lot of these communities where they can take their families, they can relax, they can enjoy outside. Uh, and the report found that disproportionately these are sprayed. Um, and it's very likely the case in other US cities. And so, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, you, you know, those kids that sang, sang to the city council, they never gave up their fight. Uh, they stuck with the work for years uh, through elementary school and middle school and between strong environmental justice work of the Black Institute, dogged efforts uh, from Ms. Fergovin and her class. And, you know, sure, uh, beyond pesticides, uh, other local policy advocates like a grassroots environmental education. They provided a lot of technical, we provided technical scientific support uh, and policy concepts early on. We were, we were able to break through a seven year delay uh, to pass an ordinance on Earth Day this year. And strongly encourage you all, uh, there's a New York Times article uh, uh, that highlights uh, these, these young advocates. Uh, they interview and highlight them and uh, really an amazing, amazing victory uh, at such a young age and really encouraging about what they're going to be able to accomplish in the future. And nothing warms the heart of an English professor as much as knowing that drama has made an, <laughs> an impact. So that's just wonderful, the power of art. But it takes, Absolutely. You know, it takes all of us, right? And from all fields in order to make impacts here. Kara, do you want to close us out with a couple of words or? Yes. Uh, I just want to say if you have are part of an HOA, uh, you know, that if you can make a change there, it will matter. And it will matter because homeowners are, uh, they actually apply more pesticides per pound per acre um, than any other group. And that's largely because uh, we're not trained, right? We buy the product, we read, kind of read the label and then we apply it. Um, and uh, that is, you know, a, an opportunity for community education, but it's also the reality of, of um, it's a place where we can have a big impact, right? So what can you do at your HOA? You can ask your HOA to adopt IPM as a step towards banning uh, certain types of pesticides. And, and so that when they contract out with a company, they're looking for someone who knows how to practice that, right? Who actually has the certification, who's committed to doing that and not just greenwashing the chemicals that they're using. Um, another thing you can do is to push for an approved use of pesticides. So what are the really specific weeds that are uh, that are popping up in your HOA that really need addressed that are community concerns, things like poison ivy, right? Things that are, uh, you know, have a real, uh, that are really risky. And then what are some things that you can live with? Um, dandelions can be uh, quite quite lovely sometimes. So, <laughs> uh, but that, that's a good conversation to have there, right? So what are, what are the weeds that we can, uh, what are the pests we can live with and what are the pests that we need to deal with, right? So that that's a good space to act. I think, you know, uh, working in schools, I host IPM trainings every year. And I gotta say, they're some of the best workshops 
uh, we have. And it's uh, me with a bunch of custodial staff, uh, janitors from your public school districts in Southwestern PA, you know, like the folks who will call me and say I have a raccoon problem. And, uh, <laughs> and it, part of my job is helping them find an answer, right? So we gather together and we talk about IPM. They bring really specific concerns. One school was struggling with bed bugs, another with termites in an old building. And it's in that space that we workshop these ideas. And I think that's a really great win. There's a great win there too, because it's in those conversations with a group of, you know, a lot of older um, uh, white men and women who are from rural places in, and who have spent their lives in those school buildings, right? Their careers in those school buildings. You know, we're coming together and we're having conversations about bugs and pests, but we're also having a conversation about climate change, right? We're having a conversation about things that they've never seen before that are now in their community. And that, that's something that I think, you know, in Westchester and in, in a little bit in Western PA now too, you know, I, I, I know something we wanted to talk about with spotted lanternfly. Like, I think it's really important. And to some of John's point, like, we're, we're hard on DEP, but pesticides in our state are regulated under Department of Agriculture. DEP has no say in them. Uh, and that's really interesting, right? Because what about the homeowners? What about the schools? DOA doesn't know. Department of Ag doesn't know about childcare pests. You know, they're not gonna create a bed bug fact sheet. We do have a community IPM program. It is staffed by two people <laughs> in Philly, um, one of who is leaving at the end of this month. Um, and they're the folks who are carrying a lot of this work for communities for free. And so we need to invest in the resources to have folks who can answer these questions um, about what pests are showing up in our communities and how to deal with them in a safe way. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, the whole thing with spotted lanternfly and bifenthrin and the concerns around that, you know, it's because spotted lanternfly is, is an agricultural pest. And where does DOA get their money to uh, address issues like spotted lanthorn plan from the farm bill? So when we're thinking about how resources are moving into our state to deal with this, um, it, it, John's right, it's not just on DEP, it's not just on EPA, but it's it's also thinking about the, this, oh, the weird way that our, our state agencies sometimes don't talk to each other. Uh, um, and, 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 and with spotted lantern fine and some of these other invasive pests that we're seeing, you know, when we're looking at IPM and we're choosing what is the best tool in our toolbox to use, sometimes we don't have the tool yet, right? We don't have the tool yet to, to deal with this issue. And that's what we're kind of learning with spotted lantern fine. It doesn't look like how it did when it was a pest in Korea. It doesn't behave the way it did when it was a pest in Japan. It's behaving totally different than anyone's ever seen it in the places where it's been before. Um, and so as we're looking at our toolbox and what we have available, um, you know, we're trying to make the best choices. And I'll just end with saying that, you know, science isn't an answer, right? The research that we've presented today, it's, it's, not, it's not a stop point. It's a process, right? It's a process of how we answer these questions and how, we, how does science take communities' concerns and do research that addresses it? Uh, how does it help answer really relevant questions that our community has? And I think that's where our research uh, needs to go in the future. Um, Thank you, and thank you very much for all the information that you've all just provided. Um, we'll save clapping till the end, but there's gonna be a big round of applause that's gonna come at the end of this. Um, Nathaniel, are there any questions from uh, participants that have appeared in the chat? Let's see. Oh, you are muted. If you are saying, I have a question. Can okay, yeah. Why don't we yeah. go ahead and then okay. yeah, we'll. I'll okay, I'm, I'm on the question. I'm on the uh, West Pikeland um, EAC, and this is a a topic that we just brought up at our last meeting to begin addressing. So it seems overwhelming. You got the state, you have the township, and you have the residents. So Drew, what would you say is Step number one to get started. This is in regards to lantern fly. No, this is in regard to pesticides. I'm sorry, maybe I'm jumping the gun. I thought this was overall questions for oh. everything. This oh, yeah, just yeah, how yeah. To ban pesticides. Right. Uh, sure, sure, right. absolutely. So we always encourage advocates um, to approach this issue in good faith. You got to assume that all stakeholders on this issue surrounding pesticide use. They wanna be responsible. They wanna be protective of human health and the environment. Um, 
local officials, pesticide operators, can you know, chemical landscapers, not bad people. They're just like every you know person in this country. They're working hard to provide for their families and protect their community. Um, so with local advocacy, our focus is definitely on education and not castigation. We want to discuss the negative impacts of pesticides, uh, but you know, put your efforts into you know telling telling these stories um, of folks in your community. Maybe they've been injured by pesticide use, or maybe they've got you know like a fun drama piece that they want to talk about uh, with pesticides. Um, you know, after all, there's not going to be support um, for pesticide elimination policies unless you've got you know folks behind you, um, uh, you know, joining you in these efforts. Uh, you want to emphasize the positive impacts of pesticide reform. Talk about the ability to improve public health, clean air and water, healthier ecosystems for pollinators and other wildlife, uh, and cost savings over the long term. And once you get together with a group of advocates, I always recommend that you give yourselves a name, um, whatever best reflects your efforts, uh, because it's going to show that you represent that group of like-minded residents. Um, and then you can begin your outreach to stakeholders, uh, environmental organizations, organic landscapers, community groups, garden clubs, churches, your local PTA, um, definitely connect with the great folks at Toxic Free Philly uh, who did amazing work putting together um, an outstanding uh, cadre of experts uh, to present to the city council. And, you know, cultivate those professionals, um, local doctors, nurses, ecologists, other practitioners. Um, if you are working at the local government level, um, get in contact with your elected officials, including the mayor, you know, uh, city town council, uh, develop that relationship um, and introduce the issue to their office. What you're gonna wanna look for is a, is a champion uh, to carry your cause. Uh, champion is, is in a leadership position is crucial because they're gonna be the best person to lobby other elected officials in your area. And uh, no, so it, what if you're, work, if you're working towards a school board, um, you'd be working towards the school board uh, officials. Um, and HOA, you're gonna be working towards the board of directors. You wanna kind of power map and who's, who's in charge of pesticide use um, in your community. And uh, what you're gonna wanna work towards is getting that formal, getting a formal hearing on, on pesticide use. If you can't get one right away, then you need to start thinking about how to apply external pressure. Um, maybe that's tabling at community events, Maybe that's starting a petition or a, a phone call campaign. Um, letters to the editor can also be effective. And then once you get that hearing, make sure that all those folks, maybe that sign your petition, you're in contact with them over email, uh, get them to show up to that hearing, whether it's on Zoom or in person, because um, the show of support from residents is going to be really important to this. And uh, yeah, once, yeah. Uh, after you get that, of course, feel free to reach out to us at any part of the policymaking process. Uh, we do have model policies, as I mentioned earlier, and, and can help with a lot of the kind of technical and scientific details and background. Just to follow up on that, yeah. um, as far as educating the public and educating our township supervisors, do you have a list of the best things that we should read that are current and scientific? Yeah, you can go on our website. Okay, all right. <laughs> beyondpesticides.org and check out our um, non-toxic lawns and landscapes page. There's, a, there's a, um, a subsection under there called tools for change and that's uh, really focused for advocates like yourself. Okay, that's great, thank you. Thank you. Our, so then, I think, Drew, um, could I, could I ask a yeah. question directly to Drew about that one? Is, is there any, a model ordinance or something like that that he could look for on your website? Yep, if you go to that Tools for Change page, you will definitely see our model ordinance. Uh, we also have a map of US pesticide reform policies where we list over 150 uh, policies. Uh, you can, uh, you, and if you go on that map and you type in organic methods, you'll get the ones that we would consider to be models throughout the country. Um, and yeah, you can, that map is great because you can click on pesticide policies throughout the country and it'll, it'll pull up um, the actual policy so you can read it and review it. Uh, Emma, you wanted also to address that because there are two other questions I'm seeing in the chat at this point. Yeah, well, I'll just point out, I think Kara put a great, um, you know, model ordinance in the chat as well. And Beyond Pesticides whole website has a ton of useful resources. Um, I think Drew just laid out a great campaign plan. So that's awesome. I would add, um, and I think this is something that even advocates like myself sometimes have to be reminded of, that 
sometimes the most important first step is just to ask for what you want. Um, and I would say with pesticides in particular, that legislative issue, a really great first step is figuring out if you can, what is actually being used, like defining the scope of the problem and figuring out what it looks like in your community, which looks different in different places. Like here in Philadelphia, we didn't have reporting requirements on what pesticides were being used in the city. So, you know, we had to file a right to know request and, um, in one case, it was completed and we you know, were able to get some information from it. In another case, the city didn't provide that information. So you might have to do a little bit of digging. That's a good place to start to figure out what it really looks like before you start. And then um, I would say, you know, get in contact with whoever your target is or where you think the change can be made and ask them to make the change. And then they probably won't right away. I would launch into the campaign plan that Drew just laid out. Okay, we're gonna answer the two questions that are in the chat and then we're gonna call it a night. Now Nathaniel, it looked like you have a question that you wanted to ask. Well, thank you, Cheryl. Yes, particularly I think um, for, for Kara, state law requires any spraying on public school grounds to be announced in advance so that staff, children, parents can take measures if they wish. That applies only to public schools, does not apply to private schools, religious schools, charter schools, daycares. And of course, we know that in daycares, the kids are probably particularly susceptible. Is there any movement to try to amend the state law to include all kinds of schools in the advance warning that's required? Yes. Um there there is uh and we have worked with some uh legislators in harrisburg um, to begin those questions i think you know at we when our health policy strategy is pretty simple um it's about removing barriers and increasing benefits so i i think the piece that we are trying to figure out is um what what are the what are the alternatives, right? What are the pests that we're seeing in that space and, and how do we troubleshoot them? And who's gonna provide those resources to child cares and schools? Because you know, right now, my schools feel comfortable calling me with these questions and knowing that they'll get an answer in, you know, within the week. I can't say that there's someone else who provides that same type of service on the Eastern or even central part of the state. Um, it's not that there aren't people who can't answer those questions. I think the Penn State extensions, I even think 4-H programs um, can be a lot of uh, places with shared knowledge. Um, but I, I think that um, there are some barriers there, right? About what, what it takes to invest in doing more mechanical uh, pest prevention, right? So that includes a lot more mowing more regularly, uh, which will mean you have to hire more custodial or grounds keeping staff, which unfortunately a lot of our school districts don't have the budget for. So what does, um, you know, we've explored here in Southwestern PA, like what does even sharing those large equipment, uh, lar large equipment or even sharing staff for those types of programs, what does that look like? So where, if we took the pesticide contract money, how much landscaping services could we get in return, right? So we're doing a little bit of cost benefit analysis for our schools here based on the contracts we're able to see. Um, but yes, we definitely should be pushing for uh, uh, private schools, charter schools and child care centers to adopt these practices. We've helped a lot of home-based child care centers become IPM or pesticide free here in Western PA. So we know that there is a model that works here, um, especially for those uh, those really small providers who are running child care centers out of their home or um, out of a residential property um, who often have the least access to these resources. Um, so we know and we know it's possible for, uh, for all types of child care centers um, who function in all types of locations to make the switch. And same thing with our schools, because we've helped rural schools rewrite their IPM policies, urban schools as well. Um, so know it, we know it's possible to re reduce those barriers. Uh, we just it's about finding the political champion right now, right? Who, who will take it up and, and introduce it as a, either a school code amendment or another place, but um, well, definitely I, I, something I, we can organize around. I, I, just, just to clarify, I mean, I, I get everything you say, but this, this state law is only about notification. 
can anybody argue that children in charter schools or Catholic schools should not be notified in advance if pesticides are going to be applied? Yeah, no, I mean, that it does seem like an easy change to just include them. Um, right now, the IPM bill is a standalone bill. So there's, um, so it's a little, it's a little bit tricky that way. I think if you can amend the public school code, it might be a little bit easier legislative approach, but you're right. Like there is no, that's all benefit, right? If we're able to notify people for now, what we've been doing for the charter schools who are and parochial schools who are in our network is uh, encouraging them to have, have their families apply for the hypersensitivity registry. I put the link in the chat. This is a place, if you're an individual or a family, you can apply to be on this registry. So anytime anyone is spraying within 500 feet of the address that you list there, you can put your school, your child's school on there too as an address. You can put your child's daycare there as an address. You can put your residential home there as an address. You will be required to receive notice, whether it's uh, another homeowner who's having a, someone apply pesticides, whether it's a school nearby who's having someone apply pesticides, whether you live near a major highway and they're spraying along the side, if they're within that range and you're registered on this hypersensitivity registry, you can get notice. So it's a sneaky way to get more information about what's being sprayed close to you as well, without having to file a right to know request or Freedom of Information Act request. All right, and then just quickly, and I'm gonna keep it to one minute. Uh, if someone could address Peggy's question about the effects of pesticides on pets such as dog and dogs and cats. Anyone would like to take that quickly? Drew? Uh, sure. Uh, thank uh, you. They are uh, pets, um, of course, uh, very similar, kind of, uh, kind of similar to children in this um, arena because, you know, we talk about children, we talk about, you know, they spend more time on the ground. They spend more time with hand to mouth activities. And, you know, dogs are, are outside um, a lot of the times. They're sniffing around with their nose, um, you know, and, at cats as well. They get outside, they move around the grass. Um, the grass is, uh, if the grass is sprayed, you know, you've absolutely got a, got an issue there. Um, uh, one of the big problems with uh, pets that there has been a lot of uh, uh, research done is on 2,4-D uh, and uh, canine lymphoma. There is a relatively strong connection between the use of the chemical 2,4-D um, and, and canine cancer. Uh, that's at least what I can speak to off the top of my head. All right, um, John, uh, you have 30 seconds. Just a quick add to that, that whole idea of um, it's more than children. Non-targets was brought up earlier. It could be birds, it could be bats, it could be pets, it could be fish. Amphibians, amphibians did more to draw attention to hypersensitivities that we didn't know anything about tied to atrazine as an example. All, you have to find that audience. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to say a great thank you to our participants who have taken time out of their evenings to help educate us on these issues. Thank you very much. Clap, clap, clap. Great. And thanks to everybody else for coming. Uh, Cause I, I mean, Alexa's already putting some great ideas in the chat that we should work on, uh, get our EACs to work on. Um, ordinances for the area. So um, I think you've inspired all of us. So thank you everybody uh, for speaking and for coming out tonight. All right, thank you. Thank, right. you. thank you. Thank you all, great discussion. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much.